It was here in these woods off Florida's I-75 that in the space of one year, the police found the bodies of seven men. They were killed with this gun, a high standard double nine point twenty two. Richard Mallory, Walter Antonio, Dick Humphreys, David Spears, Charles Costadden, Peter Sims, and Troy Burrows. Eight men have been shot to death in cold blood on Central Florida highways, including the busy tourist route of I-75. But this time, there's an even more chilling twist to the slain. Police say for the first time in criminal history, these killers may be murdering with a feminine touch. On January the 9th, 1991, Eileen Carol Warnos was arrested in Daytona Beach, Florida. She worked as a hitchhiking hooker. This is the original police video of Eileen Warnos's confession. The idea of a woman killing men, a man-hating lesbian prostitute who tarnished the reputation of all her victims, brought Eileen Warnos a special kind of hatred. Terry Humphrey's father was a retired police chief. There wasn't any sex involved in my dad's murder. They cut him. They did an autopsy on my dad. They wouldn't release his body for over a week. They cut him from stem to stern. There wasn't any semen there anywhere. I can't imagine the grief, the hurt, the anguish that they have caused. This family, this is a man that I had for fear. I hope she meets up with, quote, old Sparky. You know who old Sparky is. Politicians and the Christian right campaigned for Eileen Warnos's execution. Because I'm tired of this re-election jazz. They're just trying to get promotional ladder climbing, political prestige from this. And I'm sick and tired of this. I'll probably get three more death row sentences. And then I got to go to Pasco and Dixon for two more de uh, death row. How many times you got to kill me? You know what I mean? This is, this is bullshit. They don't need to be doing this. Even Ted Bundy was offered life imprisonment. This was never offered to Eileen Warnos. By the time I met Eileen, she already had four death sentences. But surprisingly, in an odd way, I found her to be the most honest person involved in the case. All the others, her lawyer, her born-again Christian mother, the police, had all been involved in trying to sell her story for as much money as possible. Hi, how are you doing? This is Eileen when I first interviewed her in 1992 for my original film, The Selling of a Serial Killer. I say it's this. The principle is self-defense. They say it's the number. I say it's the principle. The heck with what... It, it, it has nothing to do with the number killed. It's the principle. But they're saying if there's a number, no, self-defense is self-defense no matter how many times it is. I don't care if it's a hundred times. I was very, I never provoked those guys. I never provoked them. I never showed it. any provocations whatsoever. It was very nice, very decent, very clean, very ladylike. I didn't even swear in front of my clients. And a lot of my clients, I talked about Jesus and I talked political, both mixed together and we never argued. My old film had ended with this announcement of the resignation of Florida police officers who had illicitly entered into Hollywood movie deals to sell the story of America's first female serial killer, the Eileen Warnos story. Major Dan Henry resigned as chief of staff of the Marion County Sheriff's Office after being notified of an investigation being conducted by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. The investigation being conducted by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement centers around tape telephone conversations made by Deputy Munster between he and Major Henry involving the Eileen Warnos case. There was speculation at the time that if police officers did in fact receive money, 
All Eileen Warnus's death sentences could be overturned. Twelve years later, Eileen is still on death row. There was no proper investigation into the police officers and their movie deals. It all got covered over. Eileen and I kept in touch over the years, and then a few weeks ago, I opened my front door and to my amazement was served with a subpoena to attend Eileen's final appeal before execution. I had no idea how things would turn out and that I'd be witnessing an execution in one and a half years' time. This is Ocala, Florida. All us witnesses were housed together in a motel. We're, we're gonna win this thing. I'm telling you, we're gonna win. <laughs> this is Joe Hobson, Eileen's uh, attorney. Yeah, Lawyers like Joe are kept very busy. 4,000 people are on death row waiting for execution. Okay. Okay. What? You're not very good at wheeling I'm this. sorry. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> Actually, okay. And how's this particular case been stressful, the Eileen case? Uh, it's so important because this is a, the legal system in a, in a phase where it's doing the most important thing it can ever do, and that is taking human life. Mm -hmm. It's more important than a money judgment or a you know adjudication of guilt or 30 years in prison. And um, we've really got to be careful. I mean, the whole system's got to be careful. And my op opinion and the, the whole gist of our motion is that she's been failed by the legal system. Joe Hobson that felt that Eileen had been poorly represented by her previous attorney, Dr. Legal. Most of us will probably never worry about spending time in jail, but if you are ever involved in the criminal justice system, you will need a lawyer who can... Joe Hobson was hoping to get Eileen a retrial a by discrediting Dr. Legal, otherwise jail. known as Steve. This is the Akala Cult House, where we were going to spend the next week. Steve, the lawyer, had made no attempt to investigate the cops. He pled guilty to all the murders and didn't even try and make a deal for lesser sentence. Eileen had no money to pay him, so Steve used the money obtained from interview fees. This man in front of me is the state prosecutor who wants to execute Eileen immediately. This is the first time I've seen Steve for 11 years. He said my film got him run out of town. Fuck you. What? Fuck you. Fuck you and the queen. <laughs> and like, like, what are you reading? Fuck you and your ducky yeah. daddy. Well, nice to see Don't you. Don't talk to me. What? Don't talk to me. I gotta put. Contacted by Mr. Broomfield uh, in 1992. Do you recall specifically charging or attempting to charge Mr. Broomfield $25,000 for an interview? I didn't attempt to charge anybody anything. If Ms. Warnus asked me, Steve, I or told me, Steve, I want $25,000 for this interview, I would have passed that on to the person who was interviewing. But it's, it, it's not my position to uh, um, set fees, or we didn't have a fee schedule. Will you admit that you are depicted on the movie, The Selling of a Serial Killer, doing exactly that, trying to get $10,000, or I think $25,000 for an interview? Uh, there's, there's, uh, I don't think there's any evidence that I tried to get $25,000 or anything. So the next stage is really to come up with a counteroffer. No, the next stage is coming with twenty five thousand dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. we but okay, to, okay. Well, then, then, well, then if do you a don't, then the next offer. thing to do is to really get a counter offer and let's if and let's and tell her something. So we would basically then pay the money to, well, we pay money to you or to, as 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 her legal. As her mom, and then um, Steve gets a percentage as our agent. Right. Very 
Nick, wait a second. What's Davy Crockett doing on the hundred dollar bill? Thank, thank you very much. Have you seen the Mr. Broomfield's production, The Selling of Serial Killer? Yes. You, you, okay. And you've seen yourself depicted in that movie? Yes, sir. Do you recall joking in that movie that your advice to any client facing the electric chair was to quote Woody Allen, don't sit down? I remember making a, a lot of jokes in that movie. Judge, you're talking about the depictions of Mr. Glazier in the movie The Selling of the Serial Killer that the defendant submits fairly <coughs> captures the essence of his approach to a representation which clearly impeaches his claim that he had taken this an altruistic pro bono national lawyer was killed and helps establish the claim that all along his motive in taking this case was the publicity and the money to be made. I have to say I always liked Steve. He was an old hippie from Micanopy who was just way out of his depth. Uh, the only thing really to do here is to uh, have breakfast and then leave. <laughs> this is Dawn Botkins, Eileen's best friend. What was that little ditty you had about Akala? I really don't believe Steve took the case on for money, but he was so inexperienced he could only plead guilty for Eileen. He didn't even have a fax machine or law office. When I was living in a teepee in, uh, in Micanopy, I had, um, you know, I had, I went through the whole thing, cows, chickens, geese, and uh, I got all that. pigs. I had a cow called Sir Angus McBeef. Just so you know what he's going to be, you know, you try to uh, rationalize it. You're going into the refrigerator, you're going, and that was the last meat I was able to eat. I guess you can look at it that way. Eileen lived in a total fantasy world. She thought she'd get off the murders and then live with this woman, Arlene Prali, a born-again Christian who'd seen Eileen's picture in the local newspaper and had adopted her. Together they planned to run a horse ranch and raise she-wolves. Arlene Prali, the born-again Christian, hired Steve and persuaded Eileen to come clean with God and plead guilty. Steve had been advised that Eileen was paranoid and suffered from borderline personality disorder but still went along with this cockeyed scheme. Eileen seemed to think a miracle might happen and was outraged to receive three more death sentences. I sent a chief to death for the murder of Charles Humphreys. Case number 91-112, Citrus County case number. I sent a chief to death for the murder of David Spears. Thank you. And uh, probably see, uh, I'll be up in heaven while y'all rotten in hell. Okay, there will be an automatic appeal. You have the right to an appeal. Mr. Glazer, is that going to be handled by you May or the public defender? your wife and kids General? get raped. I would ask that uh, you would appoint right the public the defender's office. I knew I was raped and you weren't nothing but a bunch of scum. Therefore, these proceedings are now Putting completed. Putting somebody who was raped to death on the fucker. In many death row cases, a client in despair will say they want to die. It was a measure of Steve the lawyer's inexperience that he took Eileen's wish on face value. Sir, you can hold up here, please. I like to flatter myself that I was being asked for my legal opinion, but it turned out I was there to talk about Steve's marijuana smoking. The big question was whether Steve had consumed seven very strong joints before giving Eileen legal advice in prison. You know, I've got a, a short video clip I want to show, if I may. It's an excerpt from the film that depicts this alleged six, seven joint ride. And as a preliminary question, isn't it true that in doing your work, you routinely edit things, correct? Well, you always edit off to it, yeah. Because and editing involves cutting and pasting and putting things together. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah. And that's what you do all the time. I don't know about the pasting, but you certainly can't. Well, pasting in terms of inserting and connecting and making things fit together. Correct. Okay. It was 6 a.m. Steve said it was a seven-joint ride to the prison. 
and he brought along a tape of his own music with him singing and playing all the instruments, especially for the occasion. Go back. You recognize that? Yes. That's Apolo your work, isn't it? I apologize for the quality. It's not a very good copy. But that's your work? Yes. You notice that the shirt that Mr. Glazier has on is white? Uh-huh. Now, here he's got a blue shirt on, correct? Maybe he changed his shirt. I don't know. I mean... But he had a blue shirt on. And now he's got a white one. Now he's got a white shirt. Well, it's possible he changed his shirt. I've, I've got, maybe he put a, a clean white shirt on for the prison visit. But is it also possible that you just cut and paste <coughs> and took footage from one episode and cut it and pasted it into another episode to make it look like something that hadn't, in fact, happened? Uh, I remember distinctly the I mean, the seven joint right, if that's what you're referring to. No. I don't that's remember him changing his shirt, but we could, if you want, we can make all the outtakes available from that particular journey. Because well, they're, st they're still available. It's not very convenient right now, and you hadn't made those available before. Well, I didn't know you wanted them before. And I, you know, I didn't even know that the film was going to be submitted as evidence. If I was making that trip, I would probably change my shirt at the end of the trip. I don't know about you. But that, that's not the point of my question, is it? I don't know, but I would, I would probably bring a clean shirt along for my visit. <coughs> mm -hmm. you? I would. I got a message that Eileen wanted me to meet her at the local jail. We checked the film outtakes and made the great legal discovery that Steve had in fact exchanged his pongy blue t-shirt for a clean white one. My goodness. Oh my God. How are you? Get it out of there, Nick. Get it right. I'm just trying to, sorry. <laughs> sure. There was a microphone, which is you know, that. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, lady. All right. Okay. I can't believe this microphone, how small it is. You know, it actually works. It actually works. <laughs> okay, Nick. Nick, this, this interview, man. I got to, I, I, I just, let me do this thing over one more time, because I know you guys pre-tape and you clip and stuff. Right. So let me say it one more time, kind of right, okay? Because okay. I'm really concerned about the family members. Right. <clears throat> I get my hair out of my face while I'm doing this. Because I'm really concerned about the family members, man. So I want to say this again, over. Um, Nick, the reason I'm, I'm coming forth with you with this interview is because I like to come clean about my cases and because there's only about one percent chance that a person can get off death row and I come to realize that that is actually true very very true there's only like about 82 people that got off death row after in in like 30 years out of uh, like about four or five thousand death row inmates mm -hmm. and, and those are only DNA people blood temper so the chances of getting off death row are 1%, 999.9% you're going to be on it and you're going to die. Okay, I cannot go in the execution chamber and die in the execution chamber as a liar. And I cannot go in the execution chamber and be executed under the devil. 
I have to come clean and clean, cleanse my spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, so I have to come clean and tell the world the lies that went on through my mouth. I mean, the, now prosecutors and well, cops. And that, you, and that you killed the seven men. Huh? That you killed those men in cold blood. <laughs> yeah, and I got to come clean that I killed those seven men in first degree murder and robbery. As they said, they had it right. A serial killer. Not so much like thrill kill. I was into the robin biz. I mean, you know, serial killers are in this thrill killing jazz. I was into the robbing, just and eliminate a witness. But still then again, I got a number, so it's serial killer. But I'm coming clean before I go in that execution chamber and be executed that uh, I killed them. And so like when this. you met them from the beginning, did you know that you were going to kill them? when they picked you up in that cause? I pretty much, <clears throat> I pretty much had them so, uh, selected that they were going to die. But when you're saying that um, there was no self-defense, so there was no self-defense. No, there was no self-defense. Uh, I'm being really straight up about mm -hmm. everything. There's no self-defense. I'm really sorry what happened about everything. I, I was in, in this, this, to me, this world is nothing but evil, and all of us are full of evil one way or another in whatever we do. We have evil in us, all of us do, mm -hmm. and my evil would just happen to come out because of the circumstances of what I was doing, hitchhiking, hooking, mm -hmm. on the road. <laughs> I was a homeless person all my life, mm -hmm. and then the hitchhiking hook, and I learned off the homelessness and, and cruising all over the United States of America and stuff. And so, learning how to be a hooker as a hitchhiker right. eventually got tiring. In the end, I carried the gun for protection, but then I got where I was getting a real problem. And our rent was due $1,200 behind. Tyra was doing a lot of beer drinking and stuff. She wanted to go out all the time, so she was burning up the money I was making. I, I was making good, about two, three hundred a day, sometimes. But sometimes did she, and did she know what you were doing? Oh, yeah, Ty always knew everything I was doing. I met her in a bar. This is Eileen's great love, Tyra. One of the reasons I had felt so much sympathy for Eileen was that she was betrayed by those closest to her all her life. We were sitting on the floor watching TV. And she just come out and said, I have something to tell you. And I asked her what. And she said that she had shot and killed a man that day. Tyra knew about the murders all along, but didn't come forward to say anything until she was questioned by police. Tyra, who was never charged with anything, was then made a state's witness, and it has been asserted, became part of the movie rights package in the Hollywood police film deal. It was Tyra who got Eileen to confess in a series of taped phone calls. Hello? Hi. Yes. Yes. Hi. Hey. Hey, I had to call you early because I didn't know if you were going to leave today or what. I don't, what the hell is going on, Lee? They've called, they've been up to my parents again. They've got my sister now asking her questions. I don't know what the hell is going on. Huh. Were they asking your sister questions? I don't know. If Lee, they're, they're coming after me. I know they are. No, they're not. They're innocent. They've got to. Why are they asking so many questions then? Honey, listen, listen, listen. Do what you got to do, okay? I'm going to have to because I'm like going to go to jail for something that you did. This is unfair. My family is a nervous wreck up there. My mom has been calling me all the time. She doesn't know what the hell's going on. Okay. You've got to do, okay? All righty. What? I'm not going to let you go to jail. I don't know whether I should keep on living or if I should... No, Ty, Ty, listen. And what if they don't believe me? Ty, listen. What? I'm not going to let you go to jail or anything. Listen, if I have to confess, I will. Okay. So you were very close. Yeah, we are all right. <laughs> and I still miss her, and I still love her. And 
But I'm really, and I'm really sorry about everything I've done. I, I miss Ty. I lost Tyra over this. And then the people that lost their loved ones and everything. I, I really think first about the people that lost their loved ones and then Ty second. Because I have to put them in first on this whole thing. I'm really sorry for, the, you know, them losing their and loved the, ones, man. I and, know the feeling. And what about with, with Richard Mallory? Because you gave that testimony with Richard Mallory. Yeah, Richard Mallory is definitely was not self-defense. Richard Mallory I killed and for, he had, ex uh, I needed his wheels to move the stuff and he had the right amount of money I needed to move into the apartment, so. But what about the testimony that you gave in court about? Oh, that's just, like I was saying. About the visine and. Oh, I was just doing a lying biz. It was just my lying gig, try to beat the system. Really? So that was really all, none of it was true? And he said, it doesn't matter to me. Their body, your body will still be warm for my huge cock. And he said, he was choking me and I was holding it like this. And he said, do you want to die, slut? And I just nodded no. And then he said, are you gonna, you gonna listen to everything I've got to say? Have you do? And I just nodded yes. They want to Takes the visine. And he lifts up my legs and he puts what turns out to be rubbing alcohol in the visine bottle and he sticks some up my rectum area and that really hurt really bad because he tore me up for a while and put some in my vagina which really hurt bad And then he walked around to back to driver's seat side and he pulled my nose open like this. Pulled them open and he squirt rubbing alcohol down my nose. And he said, I'm saving your eyes for the grand finale. And he put the visine back on the dash and I spit in his face. And he said, you're a dead bitch, you're dead. And he's wiping his eyes. And I laid down real quick and I grabbed my bag and he was starting to come for, for me when I grabbed my bag and threw, whipped my pistol out toward him. And he was coming toward me with his right arm, I believe, and I shot immediately, and I think I shot twice, as fast as I could. Because in court you gave such a graphic description of what had happened with Richard Mallory. Yeah, after sitting around thinking how I could drum up a story, you know. That was pretty convincing. Was it? That's sad. Well, I thought so. God, that's sad. Well, and it's not, and it's not that you just decided that you wanted to die and you wanted to get it over and done with that you changed your story. No, the reason is, is it's serious. You, there's no way, and nobody should go in that execution chamber dying on a hope for a lie and a, even by the second make it out of this thing on a lie. But I heard, you know, that you just couldn't stand being on death row after 12 years. Nick, I'm not, this is the last time I'm gonna say it. You have to kill Eileen Warrens because she'll kill again. I had always believed that Eileen Warnos had acted in self-defense and that Richard Mallory, her first victim, who had a long history of sex crimes and who had spent five years in an institution for sex offenders, had tortured and tormented Eileen, pushing her over the edge into an insanity which led to the other six murders. This is what Eileen said to Judge Muriel Blunt before the sentencing on the Richard Mallory murder. What I did was what anybody else would do. I defended myself, which everybody has the right to defend themselves. And I had no intentions of killing anyone. I would not do that. This is not 
I'm not that type of person. But the jury didn't go for it. This was Eileen's reaction on receiving her first death sentence. The majority of the jury, by a vote of 12 to nothing, advise and recommend to the court that it impose the death penalty upon Eileen Carol Buenos, also known as Susan Lynn Blahovic, also known as Lori Christine Grady, also known as Cami Marsh Green, dated at Deland, Volusia County, Florida, this 30th day of January, 1992. I couldn't believe what happened the next day in court. Eileen objecting to her own witnesses. Um, and I need to get this on record. If it's She's taking it down. Okay. Uh, the there are some witnesses that are coming to yes, this thing, and um, I've already told my attorneys on numerous occasions these people did not grow up with me at all. Um, they lived in the neighborhood. But they didn't really associate with me, my brother, and my sister, and everybody else. Here's the only thing: the attorney can call them, but he can't put on anyone he thinks is is, uh, is committing perjury. That, that's unethical for him to do that. He's, if he thinks they're lying, if he knows that they're lying, he can't put them on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Yes, ma'am. Uh, oh, yes, sir. May the defense request a. Uh, Ten minute recess. Yeah. Okay. Well, in view of what, well, okay. In view of the statements, in I need to confer with my co of, of course. Yeah. Okay. We, they want to take ten minutes and confer on what they want to say. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Oh, we in recess for ten minutes. Eileen was deliberately sabotaging her own defense, but the witnesses were called anyway. <laughs> Danny Corwell, like many other boys in the neighborhood, lost his virginity to Eileen. Eileen was trading blowjobs for cigarettes from the age of nine. I was just heading over there to see who was there and uh, got up to the fort and the uh, door was kind of closed, so I, you know, opened it up and Keith had, uh, Keith and Mark had Eileen in there. So what do you mean that they had Eileen in there? Well, they had her in there and you know, she was naked and... And, and what was happening? Well, um, Keith was having sex with her. Did you stay during that? Yes. Did you ever have uh, sex with Eileen again? Uh, just that day. Jerry Moss, who was a lover of Eileen's, pretended in public he didn't even know her. She, she wanted us to be boyfriend, girlfriend in public, and I... When, when you were in public around other kids, when the rest of the kids were around, how did you treat her? Like she was nobody, like she was dirt, like I had nothing to do with her, you know. What would you say to her? Tell her get the fuck out of my face and go some fucking place else. Would you call her any names? Call her ugly, bitch. If she were following along behind you, what would you do? You would, uh, depend on who was with me or whatever, but I'd turn around and throw rocks at her and tell her to get the fuck out of there, go home. Why, why would you do that? Because I didn't want to be seen with her. I didn't want to be associated with her. Do you 
know whether she was having sexual relations with anyone else at this time? Yes, I did. And who was that? Um, her, her brother, Keith. Is that her uncle, or is that her actual? That's father? her actual, actual brother. I just want to make sure that, you know. I just wanted to remark that I need to take a polygraph on what they're saying because there's too much oral surgery. All right. Michel Chauvin recalled an incident with Eileen's grandfather. I don't know how much you want me to say. He was a bastard. Do you recall an incident uh, when you and Eileen skipped school? Yes. What happened when, uh, did you go to Eileen's house with her? Um, I walked home with her and we had gotten caught. And I remember looking through the front, they had a um, screen door view. And the minute she walked in, he had her over a chair. And I stood there and watched him. And he beat the hell out of her with a black belt that was around his waist. He took it off and told her to lean over the chair and walloped on her for a good five minutes. Was this uh, what you would call a spanking? Oh, no. No, it was like I was, it left me hypnotized. Did he know you were watching? Yeah, he did. He was aware I was watching. Is that uh, just an example as to? That's an example, yes. It had been a long week. All the witnesses stuck together in this motel. Do you think we'd all go mad if we were locked up here much longer together? Dawn insisted that gays hadn't been invented when she and Eileen first became friends. They weren't invented or whatever. There was no gay people. Well, what were they all doing? They weren't gay. There was no such thing as gay. They were in the closet. No, they weren't. There was no such thing. I don't remember a person at school gay. I didn't hear this gay stuff till 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, maybe 15. It's just now starting to be acceptable. <laughs> but no, there was not. Was there gay people when you went to school? I'm sure that there probably were. I went to a British public school. There were many. Was That's where it was invented. Gay, Us and the Greeks, you know? No we, way, really? Mm. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I just have to do this, sorry. Look, come on, you guys. After all that, Eileen decided to volunteer for execution, and we all went home. Now that Eileen was confessing to being a cold-blooded killer, Eileen found she had a lot of new friends. Her appeals have been exhausted. She wants to meet her creator. She's on my list, absolutely. Governor Jeb Bush is expected to sign Warnos's warrant soon. We had all come to this as witnesses, hoping to get Eileen off death row, but it now felt like we were taking part in an execution. There was talk of making an appeal on the grounds of Eileen's mental competence. We traveled to Troy, Michigan, where Eileen grew up, to find out more. This is Dawn's house. Hi, Joan. How are you? Oh, I you a lot. My kids just come over with the grandbabies. So the granddaughter and her grandson. How are you? It's called Look at This Stuff. Dawn gets up and writes to Eileen at 5 a.m. every morning. I got looking for one thing today. So I figured while I had Eileen's shit out, you can see her. For all this. Yeah, and I got lots of pictures of her brothers and stuff like that that you might want to look at. Really? Well, yeah. All this? All this. I was looking for her will. I couldn't find her will. Her will? Yeah. Can he just sit down for a while? Eileen does the most amazing ink drawings that you can only see against the light. Because you can't see them by looking down at them, but it's perfect with the sunlight outside. See how that does that? Wow. 
Have you got any any pictures of when she was quite young? Oh. <laughs> They're kind of funny. That is funny. <laughs> oh, that's her sister. That's that's her graduation. That's Laurie. Yeah, that's what she looks like now. There were other photos too. Eileen aged four. Her brother Keith aged six. Eileen's biological mother, Diane, who abandoned Eileen when she was six months old. Eileen's father, Leo, who was convicted of kidnapping and sodomizing an eight-year-old boy. He committed suicide in prison. Eileen's grandfather, Lowry, who she called dad and is rumored to be Eileen's biological father. He abused both Eileen and her mother. Eileen aged 13 when she got pregnant and had a baby boy that was put out for adoption. After the baby, Eileen became the local untouchable. She spent two years living in the woods at the end of her street. Eileen used to have a fort back here, as a matter of fact. Fort? A fort. Oh, with Dennis. <laughs> Yeah. So Eileen would just sleep rough. Mm -hmm. She'd either sleep in the cars or she would go around prostituting at night to keep warm, stuff like that. And hopefully she'd get a hotel. You know, some of these guys would say, we'll go get a hotel and then she could get a shower. That's how she washed and stuff like that. Or she would go to that gas station up there, which is still there, by the way. It used to be the Clark. Yeah. That's we used to go in there and pinch our nose and drink, what was it? Boom, Peppermint schnobs. Oh. It's disgusting. Yeah. It's the only way you could drink it, to get the quick buzz. <laughs> no, it sounds sickening. It was sickening. But it must have been freezing in the winter. Well, it was for her. I didn't come out here in the winter, I'm sure. I don't but think none of us out did. Here in the winter. Yeah, that's why she left. So did the other kids pick on her, though? Yeah. Do you remember where we're at? Yeah, they always picked on her, or she picked on them. Because they always had something terrible to say about her. But that's because she had a baby, and they naturally assumed that she, well, she did get, you know, she slept with people for money and all that. So I imagine the girls in our days probably thought, well, she sleeps with everybody, and all. they just didn't like that. They don't think it's funny now, though. How do you mean? They think it's terrible how they treated her. Yeah. And everybody all of a sudden comes out of the woodwork and said, oh, I was nice to her. I gave her clothes and stuff like that. No, they didn't. We went to visit Dennis Allen, who lived in the woods with Eileen and now lives in this house. Hi. How are you? Hi, how do you do? Jim? I'm Nick. Nick? Jim. Dennis. Hi, how do you Hi. do? I'm Jim. Hi, Joe. Hello. Hi. And who, who are these fine creatures? Oh, those are my birds. That's uh, Freckles and Frida. Freckles and Frida. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of Dennis, who used to be a cross-dresser. Dennis looked out his only picture of his time in the woods with Eileen. It was kind of a mess around there. In fact, the police took this picture. Oh, That's did how they? I got it. Yeah, I don't know if you can. What's it off? Let's see. Well, this was when they were subdividing. They threw all the stumps over in one section, and these were all made with stumps with. Um, straw packed in around. This is where I slept. It was just long enough to get in there and sleep. And so Eileen would come and visit you? Yeah. Every now and then she'd find one of my camps and come. In fact, the last camp I was at when Eileen found me was what we called the Little Round Lake. Mm -hmm. It was way down at the bottom of a gully and it was round. And I had a piece of plywood that somebody had left there and I just made a lean tone with two posts and put that up on it. And that was the last place, in fact, Eileen, last camp she'd come that I had was that one.
This is a picture of Chief, the local pedophile. He's thought to be the father of Eileen's child. Chief later committed suicide. He was like a bit of a strange old man, wasn't he? Kind of, yeah. A lot of people thought he was. But they were a gathering place there for kids because they had kids from everywhere that came there all the time. And uh, I remember when I was little, see, Chief would want to pick kids up and put them on his lap, and he'd talk and tell them about this and that. And I never would allow it because I just, he kind of freaked me a little bit. I can remember one time uh, he had some chicken eggs because he had chickens and all this kind of thing. And he'd pick them open when they were ready to hatch. And I couldn't stand it, him doing that. He'd pick them open. He would pick the shells open as they were trying to come through. He would pick them open, and it would be too early for them still, you know, because... And they'd die. A lot of times they would. They weren't really ready to come out of there yet. They wouldn't live. They're still there. Michelle drove us to Eileen's old home. They grew up as Vietnam was ending See, and drugs right were right everywhere. Here. Eileen's house is right over there. You want to go buy it? Yeah. OK. Take you by it. This was Mark Farron's house. We were all connected together. We all used to hang in the neighborhood, you know, <clears throat> all the kids packed together. This was Terry Cox's house right here. Um, she used to do a lot of drugs with who lived in this little white one. This is Eileen's house right here. This is it. And that's it, there. That's it. This is her house. And when you saw her being beaten, where? Uh, that door right there, I was in front of that door. See, they've redid the house since then, but the, that room in the very back is her bedroom. Not the first one, but the one in the and back. And that's where she was being? Yeah, this one, the second window. And she, see how low they are? She's, we, she used to walk, climb right out of them. If somebody sees us in here, they will come out and raise hell, because I, Corey was with me when that happened last time. And uh, <laughs> lived right here, and they were druggies also. <clears throat> we used to hang together and go over there and smoke pot and do whatnot and getting all kinds of shit. <laughs> but lots of different drugs. Yes, lots of um, pills, actually. Pills. LSD. Mescaline, bladder acid. Um... Eileen, age 16, left Michigan and traveled down here to Florida looking for son and friends. She was young and pretty, earning good money as a hooker, but with a violent temper and soon in trouble. She knocked one man out with a beer bottle, another with a billiard ball. She particularly liked it here near Daytona Beach. This is one of the motels, the Fairview, where she frequently stayed. It was also new and exciting. Just down the road is the last resort biker bar where Eileen liked to hang out. She was allegedly great friends with the human bomb. dizzy right now. Real dizzy. Did you know Lee well? Yeah. Uh, can I talk to y'all in a few minutes? I gotta walk this off. After Keith, her brother, died of cancer age 21, Eileen surprised everyone by marrying this man, Louis Fell, who was 76 years old and president of the Keystone Coal Company. But after only a month, Lewis filed for restraining charges after Eileen beat Lewis with his own walking stick. In her late 20s, Eileen gave up on men and started dating women. Here's Tyra, who became Eileen's family. They lived together for over three years. This was one of the homes they had. Eileen saw herself as a kind of Bonnie and Clyde character on the run with her lover, Tyra. Eileen and Tyra's favorite pastime was drinking beer and firing their pistols in the woods. Eileen got books on being a survivalist. She wanted Tyra all to herself. 
Tyra described Eileen as a fantasist who became jealous and possessive and who could be violent and frightening. In the end, Tyra ran off as the police were closing in. In loneliness and desperation, Eileen ended up with this man, Dick Mills. This is that paper you're talking about? Yeah, it's called, it's, uh, it's called My Sex Romps with Kinky Man Killer. Dick had sold his story to the news of the world. All I want to know is, who's the best lawyer right there, man, to suit him for this trash? Who never talked that can shit? Can I quote you a, a bit? If you said this, right? We were lying in bed one night when she started talking about her favorite sexual fantasies. She said she often got turned on by imagining she had a black hood over her head and was tied to a tree in a forest. Then a guy would come up, rape her, and shoot her in the head. She said the actual killing would make her climax. I was real sickened by what she said. Wrong. Wrong. There's partial truth to that, but most of that, I don't know where it came from or who got it or nothing about it. And you can check any film anywhere in the country or anybody that's got it, and I've never said that, okay? It goes along the lines that uh, she told me one time that the idea was that she'd like to lay in bed out in the middle of the forest, the woods or somewhere in the mountains or something, have a hood over her head or something, and somebody crawled in through the window and they said, no, they had the hood on or something, and would rape her or this and that kind of shit, and she liked that. I mean, as did, far as all these other things go did, pertaining to her, did, there's did no reality really to it. Did you feeling that she hated men, or...? No, I just got the feeling she's what she was, a dyke, except I didn't know she was a killer. There's no way I could I know mean, that. But, I mean, could you tell that when you made love to her, or...? Nah, not particularly. She just probably liked it either way, whatever came along. Didn't really seem to matter much. It's just another bad experience, I'm sure, for both of us. This is Eileen when first charged with the murders. It was just after the phone conversations with Tyra that had led her to confess. What Eileen didn't know was that Tyra herself was involved in movie discussions involving Florida State Police and production companies in Hollywood. They were selling her story, the story of America's first female serial killer. Understand that I took the charge? Yes, I do, sir. Do you wish to be represented by counsel? Yes, I do. Can you afford to hire an attorney? No, sir. Do you work? No. Uh, I'm in no. jail. How can I work? <laughs> well, obviously you're not working now, but how long has it been since you last worked? Oh, uh, about... Oh, 84, possibly. You haven't worked in six or seven years? How do you, how do you support yourself? I'm a special call girl. When Sergeant Brian Jarvis, who is now a police chief in New York State, objected to these movie discussions, he was taken off the Warnos case. Right, I was actually transferred back into the, the patrol division. Uh, it had followed a month of uh, continual harassment on the job uh, in the current position I was in, which ultimately started when uh, Captain Vinegar had realized that I found out about their plan uh, to work with Tyria Moore in obtaining a uh, movie rights package. The state attorney's report There's found that three of Jarvis's fellow officers Captain Binniger, Sergeant Munster, and Major Dan Henry were involved in movie discussions with Tyria Moore after Eileen's arrest. Yeah, ultimately, when the when the uh, arrest came, Lee Warnos was charged with the murder, and Tyria Moore was not charged with anything, but she was made a uh, a state's witness, and she was working with these uh, fellow officers on obtaining uh, movie rights. This note was then pinned onto Sergeant Jarvis's back door and his home burgled. Less than a month later, on November 25th, uh, my wife had gone out to the post office in the store uh, during the daylight hours, uh, it was like 10 o'clock in the morning. When she came home, the house had been broken into, the doors were ajar. Uh, she went up to my office and all of the files on the Wernos case, on the, the uh, investigators and, and all the information I had had been trashed. Nothing else had been touched in the house. How do you feel, Eileen? Trust these perfect cops and your conspiracy, please. Are you afraid, Eileen? I'm innocent. Eileen was right about the cops and their movie deals. But in her paranoia, she also believed that the police had known about the first murder, but allowed her to become a serial killer, because then they get more money for their film deals. Eileen's lawyers are challenging the execution on the grounds of her mental competence not that executing insane people seems to be a problem. 
In 1989, the Supreme Court ruled it was not unconstitutional to execute the mentally impaired. Eileen's paranoid delusions have gotten much worse on death row. She now believes her mind is being controlled by radio waves beamed into her cell. Eileen Werno says her food is being tainted and she's being threatened with rape. CBS 4's Joan Murray is live in Fort Lauderdale with the story. Joan? Well, now she has written a 25-page letter where she names names, names security, or rather guards at the prison where she is being held in Pembroke Pines, accusing them of harassing her while she awaits execution. And I need some, uh, an attorney, like a private attorney, to oversee my well-being until my execution. Maybe that would keep things kind of in line because there's a lot of illegalness going on. It's actually pretty hard to help Eileen, who by now, not surprisingly, doesn't trust anyone. And she's threatening to fire her lawyer if he continues to try to fight the execution. Dawn told Eileen about our visit to Troy, and Eileen asked for the opportunity to put the record straight about her childhood. All right. Yep. Will, will you let me know when she is? OK. You don't have any secret cameras in your uh, belt, eh? Oh, no, I just have to throw the large one right here. Good. Check out the orange shirt. Uh, wasn't it orange? Was it orange before? No, they changed it. It was there. They got this new thing that to wear the orange shirt out for rec or wherever, whenever you get out of your cell. Like, like death row has never escaped. Nobody on death row has ever escaped, right? And they're acting like we're escape riskers. What, what, are, what's it like being in here all the time? What's it like being in here? Well, here it's okay, it's all right, but, you know, you have your problems with some staff don't like you, James. <laughs> oh, you're a serial killer! You know, biz and stuff, and so they, you know, some staff won't treat you right because of who you have are. Have you got any friends? You can't here? be in control of everybody. Have you got any friends here at all? No, I stick to myself. I just stick in, in the cell with myself. I don't even care about going outdoors. There's nothing out there. I don't smoke anymore. So So what's your day like? How does it start? I spend 24-7 in the cell, uh, watching TV, reading the Bible, writing letters to Dawn, um, sitting around doing a lot of thinking, preparing, think, uh, memory, going back in time, memory of all everything I've been through in my life, and then just preparing for my death, get all the tears out of me and stuff so I won't cry and jazz, you know. Because so it's going to be cry. a little bit tough when I go. Huh? Getting all the tears out of you. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I just don't want to be in the execution chamber crying my eyes out, and I'm not going to. I'm going to tough it out as tough as I can. Just lay on the table, give everybody a little smile, and close my eyes and go. With Richard Mallory, he was the first that you killed. Mm hmm Did he abuse you or not? Because in the court, you said that, you know... Oh, and I, see, I'm not going to go into the... Wait a minute. Oh. No, I won't go in. I won't go into the murder. I won't go into murders if it was self-defense or not. I'm not going into any of the murders, whether or not they died in self-defense or what. I'm not going to say. I'm not saying nothing. My concern. The only reason I'm doing interviews for anybody or anything. My concern is there's. You got law enforcement out there allowing people to die. 
You get those 50 men in Canada, I mean, those 50 women in Canada that died, I'm sure the cops knew who the guy was. They're letting them kill. Mm. They want to turn them into high-profile cases for books and movies. Well, what was it? So what was it? I wondered nice how there? Eileen herself huh? viewed her childhood in nice Troy. There. Yeah, Troy's all right. Oh, and I want to uh, straighten out something, man. See, hey, Nick, I got to get this straightened out. See, the cops lied about my family. Jackie, Drew, and them, they all lied about my Well, how did they lie about your family? Because, see, okay, now I got to, see, I got to, if, this documentation, I gotta square some stuff up. Okay, here. so tell me about I, your family. Okay, the truth about my family is this: my dad was so straight and so clean, he wouldn't even wear or take his shirt off to mow the lawn. He did not believe in cussing. He did not believe in in uh, long hair and mini skirts and stuff. He was really straight really decent and so was my mom my mom hated swearing in the house if you swore you said one swear word you had a whole bar of lava soap in your mouth so i came from a real clean and decent family but why then did you get thrown out after the birth see after my mom died after my mom died my dad got pissed he's like okay this is the last straw you know i think you are the cause of mom's death because, because she had physical problems that, because of all the stress and the pain and the suffering and everything. And what I'm going through as a wild kid is pissing him off. I mean, he thinks that that killed her as well, induced her death. And so he's pissed off. He doesn't want me home anymore. But how, how did it feel like having to live in cars and in other people's It house? was living hell. That's why I went to Florida. Living hell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, sleeping in the snow, I mean, sleeping in snowy weather in a vehicle on cinder blocks at Richie's house, sleeping in with no blanket. I think I had one blanket and one pillow. It's ice cold outside. That's when I said, well, I got to go. I got to go down to Florida or something now. Because I was sleeping in the snow. Out in the woods, sleeping on the ground in the snow. You must have been frozen. I was frozen, man, yeah. I still got marks from my toes are blue to this day. My bottom of my feet are blue. This is probably why I even got my hands like this today. I don't know. My hands are, as you can see, they're like they're frostbit looking. Mm -hmm. And how were the other kids, though? How, the other kids? They're all living in their houses. <laughs> well, I was out on the streets. But that's all right, man, because, see, I, I lived through it. I survived. I went down to Florida. Then I could, you know, started trucking all over the United States of America and stuff. I mean, let me ask you one question. Do you think if you hadn't had to leave your home and sleep in the cars and stuff, it would have worked out differently? Now, if I could do my life all over again, I came from a background of a family that was right on. Where my, I mean, my family was right on. When I was thinking that, I meant... As far as my mom not dying, my dad not freaking out, and us, if I could do it all over again. My family died too young. I had to hit the road. And I came from a family that was supportive. We didn't have split sister, half sister and brother stuff and all that. It was all true blood, real blood, and everything was financially stable, and everybody was really tight. I would have became more than likely an outstanding citizen of America who, who would have either been an archaeologist, a paramedic, a police officer, a fire department gal, or an undercover worker for DEA, or ar did I say archaeology? Or, oh, or a missionary. Because I believe in God. But I'm not a Christian freak. So you think it would have... And so scrub missionary, because I'm just, I'm just thinking what I... You know, I would have came from a decent, I would have done it real decent and stuff. Let me ask you something. What, what do you think was the single most happy time in your life? What, what do you think you've enjoyed most? <sighs> Nick, I've been through so much hell. I can't even think of something there right now. And I'm so burning fucking mad about how I'm being, 
I gotta wait for my execution. I wanna get, get in the fucking chamber tomorrow and leave. And then they play, since, the, since I waved off, I've had nothing but psychological and physical fucking problems playing with it because I'm on hold with my execution. I'm so fucking mad I can't see straight. And they're just daring me to kill again. They got me pissed. The United States Supreme Court, you fucking, I'm telling you, man, you motherfuckers, keep fucking with my goddamn execution. There's going to be bloodshed. I'm sick of this. Get that fucking warrant signed. Eileen waited until she thought we weren't filming to talk about the murders. I can't do it. I would never be able to handle a life sentence or anything. And then they've said other things that are really crazy. They do crazy things to the people while they're incarcerated. I'd never be able to handle it. So I'm going for the death. I have to because they're too evil. They're too evil to the people incarcerated. And they're too evil on the cases. They're so corrupt. It's not funny, so I've got to go down. I have to. That's why I can't say nothing about self-defense on tape or anything. But was it self-defense? Huh? Was it self-defense? What? Was it self-defense? What? Was it self-defense? Yes, but I can't tell anybody. Never. I have to go down to the execution. They're too corrupt. They, they, they stick together hand over fist, hand in glove, man. So it was so. Uh, let's see. Hand, hand over fist, friend in glove. So they was, stick. was Mary self-defense? Yeah. And so was some others. But there's nothing I can do about it. All they do is give me an overturned sentence. They would never do me righteous. You see what I'm saying? They'll never do me right. They'll only fuck me over some more, so I can only go to the death. You know, I always remember you and love you. Yeah, I yeah. I love you so much, man. Take care of yourself. All right. And nice meeting nice you. To meet Take, you. Care. Take care. Goodbye, Eileen. Bye. Bye. See you later. Six months later, this announcement was made. Governor Jeb Bush signs death warrants scheduling the executions. 44-year-old Eileen Warnos is one of the nation's first known female serial killers. She will be executed October 9th for the murders of six men. Warnos has dropped all of her appeals. I did it because uh, I believe in the death penalty and I have a duty to implement the law. And a great majority of Floridians want their governor to do this. And Jeb Bush is running for re-election on a law and order pro-death penalty ticket. Eileen's execution date for October the 9th fits in perfectly a month before these elections. Brad Thomas, Jeb Bush's political advisor, is reported as saying, we want to become more like Texas. Bring in the witnesses, put them on a gurney, and let's rock and roll. We're driving to meet Diane Warnos, Eileen's biological mother. They haven't laid eyes on each other for 25 years. This is Calumet, a copper mining town on Michigan's Upper Peninsula. The Warners family originally came here as immigrants from Olu in Finland to work down the mines. Okay, let me fix my pillow here. Yeah. Okay, I want to tell you, I'm probably going to cry a little. I want to tell you something about her birth. Okay. She was a frank breech birth. That means bottom first. And a breech birth is very dangerous. And 
that's feet first and a frank breach, bottom first, is really very bad. The doctor even called in other people to, to watch it because it was so unusual. But I thought maybe that she got some kind of brain damage during that birth. Yeah. And that may have caused, while she's mentally competent, mm -hmm. it may have caused her problems. What does Eileen think about what caused her to act like that? Well, originally she said she did it in self-defense. And then she said she just needed the money. And she says that if she'd, you know, come from a home that wasn't split and... Oh, because her, her father and me getting a divorce. I, she didn't say that, mm. but I think... Um, I think she's confused because she, on the one hand, says she says it had nothing to do with her childhood. But then on the other hand, she was sleeping out in the snow for a while and living in the woods. She was sleeping in the snow and living in the woods? Mm -hmm. Immediately after she had the baby. I know nothing about that. I never heard Barry tell me that. After she had the baby, she couldn't, she couldn't move back into the house with your father? Yeah. Then she was living in the woods in the snow. Did an agent, agency find her and take, take no. care of her? And then she ended up, you know, hitchhiking around. Which she liked. Do you know the exact date of the execution? I think it's soon. Okay. I think it's very soon. I think I'll rest better. As we were leaving, Diane asked for Eileen's forgiveness. I heard Eileen just fired her lawyer. I drove to Stark, Florida, where the execution will happen, and to meet Dawn, who's doing the funeral arrangements. So what does Eileen want to wear again for the execution? Um, a black Harley Davis t-shirt with wings because she believes she's earned her wings, which she has. A pair of jeans, a pair of boots with um, corner toes, and a military belt. I think that's it, actually. She might have something else on that. I don't know. Probably a leather jacket if I know Eileen. <laughs> don't know if she can or not, but... And what other wishes did she make? You mean to be afterwards? Mm -hmm. To be cremated and come home to my house. Be around the people that love her. Why would she want to stay in Florida? Mm, she'd come home to Michigan. Eileen's ex-lawyer made a last minute plea to stop the execution, but Jeb Bush was not gonna be stopped. Based on his concerns, uh, we're going to um, ask uh, three psychiatrists to uh, analyze her to make sure that she's fit for the execution, which is a duty that I have, and I uh, intend to do it. Jeb ordered a stay of execution, but guess what? His psychiatrist examined Eileen for just 15 minutes and then gave the thumbs up to go ahead. Lynn Gordon is in our Newsplex now with the latest details. Lynn? Lori, we have just learned that Governor Jeb Bush has lifted the stay of execution for serial killer Eileen Warnos. She has been found to be mentally competent. That means she will be executed next Wednesday. Eileen's given up the opportunity to do a mass press conference 
and has asked me to do her last interview. I'm sure that's because she wants me to communicate her ideas about what she calls the crooked cops. <laughs> the last interview. Dumb rules, like I've got to stand behind this rope. There'll be 15 guards, including the warden in attendance, and Eileen, for no good reason, will wear shackles throughout the interview. She, is she on her way? Is she on her way? Or... It's been proven that the death penalty is absolutely no deterrent. States without the death penalty, in fact, have lower murder rates. You know, I already told you everything, so, you know, you just go ahead and ask me questions, and if I want to answer them, I'll answer them, okay? Okay. So, so I, I, I guess, you know, I was just wondering how you're going to be, you know, at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Are you prepared? I'm prepared. I'm all right. I'm all right with it. And how? I'm all right with it, but, like I said, Remember and tell, let them know that I know that the cops knew who I was after Richard Mallory died. I left prints everywhere and they covered it up and let me kill the rest of those guys to turn me into a serial killer. I know they did because I was no professional serial killer or anything, or murderer or whatever you want to call it, you know. I wasn't special at so, what I was doing. Eileen, how, I did how, some sloppy work, you know, and I left how prints. Have you prepared yourself for tomorrow morning? I, I'm all right with it. Yeah, hey, I'm ready to go. Hey, I was tortured at BCI. They had, they had the intercom on in the room, and they kept lying that it wasn't on, and they were using sonic pressure on my head since 1997. Sonic and pressure? And every time I was trying to write something, I, they, and I, I think they had some kind of eye in the cell, I'm not sure, but Every time I started writing something, it went up higher. So I'm thinking that probably had the TV rigged. The TV or the mirror, something was rigged. They got a huge satellite on the compound. After they put the huge satellite on the compound, it could have been either rigged to the TV set or the mirror or something, because the electrician, when he put the mirror on the wall, he said, doesn't that look like a computer? The back of it, and they stuck it to the wall. And do you think what? Did that affect your mind, do you think? Huh? Did that affect your mind in some way, the sonic? It was crushing my head and they were using sonic pressure continually. Then when I had three meetings with Miss Villacorda on it, every meeting I had, she increased the pressure of the volume of the calm, increased the harassment on the floor, increased the uh, trays being inedible, just increased every bit of my complaints and trashed all grievances. They're trying to make it look like I was crazy at all times, rig up the room with torture. If I said anything about their whole, I think their whole plan was to try to make it look like I was totally crazy. And so nobody would believe anything I had to say about anything. And then drive me there if they could. I suffered so bad. I was really struggling to survive. Had a lot of trays that were attempted murder and everything. I had to wash all my food off. And then, then one day I didn't wash my food off and I was sick for three weeks, almost died. But you're okay now. I'm okay, I'm okay. God is gonna be there. Jesus Christ is gonna be there, all the angels and everything. And you know, whatever, whatever's on the beyond, I think it's gonna be more like Star Trek beaming me up into a space vehicle, man. Then I move on, recolonize to another planet or whatever. But it's whatever's the beyond, I know it's gonna be good because I didn't do anything 
as wrong as they said. I did the right thing. And I saved a lot of people's butts from getting hurt and raped and killed, too. So are you saying that you killed in self-defense or in, in cold blood? What do you, what do you, because you, you've changed your story. I'm just trying to What are you talking about? Change story on what? No, about whether it was self-defense or not. I'm not going to say, if, you know, I'm not going to get in depth about my cases, Nick. I'm on my way to the chamber, nothing's stopping it. You can believe it or you don't have to believe it. That's up to you, man. Put a big question mark on your film. Just before we came here, we met with your, with your mother, Diane. You met with my brother and Diane? Your, I could your give mother. Oh, your mother. My, my mother, Diane, let me tell you something. She plopped me out of her belly, left me with my grandparents, and we never knew her. So tell that damn whore I could give a fuck if she even had me. She had me and left to Texas. And my mom, my dad, Barry, Keith, Lori, all of us never saw her ever again, except at funerals. My mom's funeral, my dad's funeral, and my brother's funeral. And if she's at mine, probably be spitting on her. Care less. I don't give a damn about that whore. Well, she, she asked you. I don't you, know her. I never she, even knew her. She asked you for your forgiveness. She can go to hell. She didn't have any of my forgiveness. I don't know. I don't even know her. Don't even want to know her. My only interview concerns are about cops letting me kill. So if you don't ask me about that, I'm going to cut this interview. Ask me about the cops. What do you, I mean, what more is that? To what more is there to say about the cops? <laughs> what, what more do you want to say about the cops? A lot of stuff. Did you know that they were surveilling me before I killed? And then I knew it? And that it was covered up? Did you know there was helicopters dropping down from the sky? Deputy sheriff with decoys picking me up four or five months before my arrest? It was covered up? But nonetheless, nobody ever asked me these the questions. Whether the cops were following you or not, Eileen. Oh, whether the cops were following me or okay. not, Eileen. Okay, what? Let's, say, let's say the cops were following you. Yeah. Let's say they were following uh -huh. you and they did everything that you're, you're saying they did. Uh huh. Nonetheless, yeah. you killed seven men. Yes, you did. And I'm that. asking you, what got you to kill the seven men? And I'm men? telling you because the cops let me keep killing them, Nick. Don't yeah, you not, get it? Not everybody is killing seven people. So there must have been something in you that was getting you to oh, do Oh, you that. are lost, Nick. So I was a hitchhiking hooker. Right. Running into trouble. I shoot, shoot the guy if I ran into trouble, physical trouble. The cops knew it. When the physical trouble came along, let, him, let her clean the streets. And but, then we'll pull her in. But That's how come why. there was so much physical trouble? In just it, Because it was all in one year. Seven people in one oh, year. Oh, well. Oh, well. But why not say no? Because I'm out of retaliation for taking my life like this and getting rich off it all these years in, in total pathological lying. Yeah, thanks a lot. I lost my fucking life because of it. Couldn't even get a fair trial. Couldn't even get a fair investigation or nothing. Couldn't even have my appeals right. You sabotaged my ass society and the cops and the system a raped woman got executed and was used for books and movies and shit. Bladder climbs, re-election, everything else. I got a big finger in all your faces, thanks a lot. You're, inhuman, you're an inhumane bunch of fucking living bastards and bitches, and you're going to get your asses nuked in the end, and pretty soon it's coming. 2019, a rock's supposed to hit you anyhow. You're all going to get nuked. You don't take fucking human life like this and just sabotage and rip it apart like Jesus on the cross and say thanks a lot for all the fucking money I made off of you and not care about a human being and the truth being told. Now I know what Jesus was going through. They've been trying to tell the truth and I keep getting it stepped on. Concerned about if I was raped, if I... I'm not giving you book and movie info. I'm giving you info for investigations and stuff and that's it. We're going to have to cut this interview, Nick. I'm not going to go into any more detail. I'm leaving. I'm glad.
Thanks a lot, Society for Railroad, my ass. Okay, let's go. You dirty son of a bitch. Took a rape woman and sent her to, well, you sent her to God, but you're gonna get your nuke someday soon. Hey, Eileen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was really pretty incredible that Eileen had just sailed through the psychiatric test the day before. It makes you wonder what you'd have to do to fail. Later that night, Dawn met Eileen for her last meal, Kentucky Fried Chicken and French Fries. She was limited to a $20 budget. She's sorry, Nick, that she, she didn't give you the finger. She gave the media the finger and then the attorneys the finger. She didn't give you the uh, finger. And she knew if she said much more, that it could make a, make a difference on her execution tomorrow, so she just decided not to. Okay? Well, they thought, she thought they might not execute her, yeah, she said. Yeah, she's afraid, she's afraid of something jeopardizing her ex, you know, execution in the morning. At 8 o'clock, time ticking away for serial killer Eileen Warnos. Her date with death set for about 90 minutes from now. Seven's Patrick Frazier is live in Rayford as her sentence is about to be carried out. Good morning, Patrick. Christine, in an hour and a half exactly, Eileen Warnos will be injected with a poison. Within about two minutes, she will begin to stop breathing. Now, it's tough to say who will be happier that she is dying. The families of the victims she brutally murdered or Eileen Warnos. <laughs> We did wake her up at 5.30. She um, um, requested a, a, a towel and washcloth to, to wash her face and freshen up. And she is very calm this morning, uh, not, not as talkative as she has been in the past. It was hoped Eileen would confess all to a priest before execution, but she remained angry and defiant to the very end. Eileen sent the priest packing and then knelt down and prayed for her victims, believing they might be too evil to be accepted yeah. by God. Talk about dying and... She didn't talk about dying at all. What about remorse? And it was very... All she wanted to do was to talk about the police. And I, I, you know, I just formed the impression that here was somebody who is, has obviously lost her mind, has totally lost touch with reality, and we're executing a person who's mad. And I don't really know what kind of message that, that gives. I found it very disturbing. And uh, we watched her skin turn from a sort of a pale flesh color to a grayish blue tones. Is everybody ready? Good. At 9.47 this morning, uh, the case of the state of Florida versus Eileen Warnos was carried out at Florida State Prison in a very professional and humane manner. During Eileen Warnos's brief uh, one-minute final statement, uh, she alluded to the fact of that she would be sailing away with the rock. She'll be back with Jesus Christ. Like on Independence Day, on June 6th, just like the movie, on the big mother ship, I'll be back I'll be back. Just 
Faces, actors took their places. 